Hi everyone, in this lecture, we will be talking about genetic variation. Before we begin, let's familiarize ourselves with some terms. First, we have mutation, which is a heritable change in the base sequence of a genome. Next, we have wild type strain, which pertain to organisms that are isolated from nature. Then we have mutant strains, which are organisms derived from the wild type strain that contain mutations. Then a short note on the nomenclature of genotypes and phenotypes. We usually encounter genes and proteins that have the same name, but the way that we can tell them apart is that the gene would always begin with a lowercase letter and the protein would begin with an uppercase letter. So here we can see two examples called the HIS-C gene that begins with a small letter H and the HIS-C protein which begins with a large letter H. Let's now move on to the different sources of genetic variation. The first and most common are mutations or a mutation within a gene. These can be classified as substitutions, deletions, or duplications of one or more nucleotides. When we say substitutions, this means that the nucleotide is exchanged with another type of nucleotide. A deletion is what happens when the nucleotide is removed from the gene and duplication means that a specific nucleotide is duplicated or copied within the gene. As a result, this can affect the transcript or the product of the gene, either an RNA or a protein. In this figure, we can see the gene and the altered gene with the mutation. Next, we can also find mutations within regulatory DNA sequences. These are not part of the gene per se, but are used to tell the cell whether or not to express this gene. Nucleotide changes in the DNA sequences that regulate the gene's activity can result in upregulation or downregulation of a specific gene. When we say upregulation, this means that the gene is highly expressed, and when we say downregulation, this means that the gene is not expressed by the cell. In this figure, we can see the regulatory DNA upstream of the gene, and we can see that when there is a mutation in this regulatory DNA, the gene is downregulated, as indicated by the absence of the mRNA which is found in the original genome. Let's now talk about point mutations. There are many types of mutations, but for this discussion, we'll be only focusing on the point mutations. These are changes that affect a single nucleotide pair. In this example, we can see a point mutation. The original sequence of this DNA strand is TAC and the complementary strand is ATG. When a point mutation happens, one of these base pairs is changed. And here at the bottom, we can see an example of that point mutation. So now this mutated sequence reads AAC and TTG. There are two types of point mutations. The first ones are called substitutions, and we can further classify substitutions into two types, transitions and transversions. Our transitions mean that the replacement nucleotide is with the same base category. This means that if a purine is in the original nucleotide sequence, it is replaced by another purine. And we have transversions in which the replacement is done with another or a different base category. So if there is a purine in the original sequence, it is then replaced by a pyrimidine. For the full list of pyrimidines and purines, please check out the previous video that we posted on our channel. Then we have insertions and deletions. This means that a base pair can either be inserted into the original sequence or deleted. Together, we call these as indels. Now, as we discussed previously, the result of these point mutations may alter the gene expression or even the gene function in some cases. However, the most common outcome of point mutations are actually known as neutral mutations. This means that the mutation occurs in either a non-coding sequence or the introns in eukaryotes, or the third position in codons. As a result, it does not change the amino acid that is coded for by the gene. And we call them as neutral mutations because they do not produce any noticeable effect on the cell. 
In this figure, we can see the different consequences of point mutations. We will start with the consequences of transitions or transversions. At the top, we can see the original gene sequence and the corresponding amino acids. There are four main effects of our transitions or transversions. The first one are called synonymous mutations or silent mutations. The reason why they are called silent is because they do not affect the cell in any meaningful way. This is because the altered codon specifies the same amino acid in the mutated sequence. Usually this occurs when the mutation is found in the third position of the codon. So as we can see in the wild type strain, arginine is the amino acid coded in this region and as well as in the silent mutation, it's still arginine. Then we have two types of missense mutations. When we say missense, this means that the resulting protein cannot be understood by the cell or that it does not make sense. We can classify this as either being conservative or as a non-conservative missense mutation. When we say conservative, this means that the altered codon specifies a chemically similar amino acid. So the function of the protein might not be altered as much. But when you have a non-conservative missense mutation, the altered codon specifies a chemically dissimilar amino acid. And it is usually in these types of mutations that the protein function is highly altered. Lastly, we have a nonsense mutation in which the altered codon signals for chain termination. This means that the rest of the mRNA can no longer be understood by the cell, meaning it is now nonsense to that cell. So here we can see that the original codon is mutated in order to form a stop codon instead. Next, let's talk about the consequences of our indels or base insertions and base deletions. Both of these result in what we call a frame shift mutation. As a result, the entirety of the amino acid chain is actually altered. So we can see that the wild type amino acid chain is totally different from these two frame shift mutations. We can see here the effect of an addition of a base in the original gene sequence and a removal here at the bottom. And we can see that the amino acid chain is totally different from the original amino acid chain. As we mentioned in our previous lecture, it is essential for a ribosome to find the correct reading frame in order to create a functional protein. Let's have some examples of point mutations. Here we can see that this mutation is found in the His gene and it's a mutation in the actual coding sequence. This mutation we can see here creates a premature stop codon. In other words, this is a nonsense mutation. And as a result, the mutation eliminates the enzyme required by E. coli to create the amino acid histidine. So in order to grow these E. coli, you have to grow them in an area or an environment in which histidine is present. But as these E. coli grow, eventually one of them will also have a mutation within the same gene. And if you want to isolate that E. coli, you can grow that broth in a culture that lacks histidine. And only the E. coli with the mutation can survive. In this case, this mutation has actually reversed this nonsense mutation. And now this E. coli is able to produce its own histidine. Next, let's take a look at a point mutation that affects the regulation of a gene. Here we can see that when we have a point mutation in the regulatory sequence of, in this case, the lactase gene, we can see that there is upregulation of the lactase gene in lactose tolerant populations. Normally in humans, the lactase gene is downregulated when we become adults because adults are not supposed to be drinking milk. But in regions of the earth where milk is part of their diet, these individuals have grown to have this mutated sequence, and as a result, they are able to digest milk. While in other areas where milk is not as common, we can see that there is a low percentage of lactose-tolerant individuals. Moving on to the other sources of genetic variation, the next that we will be discussing is gene duplication and divergence. As the name suggests, these involve the duplication of genes or even whole genomes in some instances. These lead to divergence because duplicated DNA can then acquire mutations of their own. 
and we can tell that these different genes were from originally the same gene because they result in gene families. Gene families are groups of genes that have a similar enough sequence wherein we can trace the lineage of that gene. So in this figure, we can see the original genome with only one copy of the gene, and in the altered genome, we can see that it now has two copies, and one of those copies has a mutation. If enough mutations occur in this new gene, it can result in a divergence between the original genome and the altered genome. So some genes do not actually gain functions of their own. They actually lose their function, and we call those as pseudogenes. In genome duplication, which happens very rarely, we have cells that end up with multiple copies of their genome. And we can mostly find these in domesticated plants. For example, in apples and potatoes, we can see that they have four copies of their genome. In wheat and kiwi, they have six copies. And in sugarcane and strawberry, they have eight copies. The next source of genetic variation is called exon shuffling. From our previous lecture, we learned that exons are specific regions in a gene that code for proteins, and introns are intervening sequences that are non-protein coding. As the name suggests, in exon shuffling, there is an exchange of exons from originally separate genes. So in this example, we can see two genes with distinct exons, and as a result from the shuffling, they now have a mixture of each other's exons. These are caused by a crossover in the intron sequences between the different exons. And as a result, they can create a new functional gene. The next source of variation is the transposition or movement of specific DNA sequences called mobile genetic elements. In eukaryotes, the most common ones are called transposons, and these move from one location in the genome to another. As a result, it can alter the activity or regulation of a gene, or it can promote other sources of genetic variation, like gene duplication, exon shuffling, and other changes. In this example, we can see the mobile genetic element in the original genome transferring into a regulatory DNA. And as a result, in the altered genome, this insertion may cause an alteration in the regulation of this gene. The last source of genetic variation we will be discussing is called horizontal gene transfer. And this is the direct transfer of genetic material from one cell to the other. Here we can see two organisms with three genes each. And during horizontal gene transfer, one of these genes is transferred directly into the organism. So we end up with an organism with four genes instead of three. This type of gene transfer is commonly seen in prokaryotes. In higher organisms, like humans and animals, we have vertical gene transfer in which genetic material is transferred from mother to child. But in this case, the genetic material is transferred from two totally unrelated cells. This can occur in three ways. First, we have transduction, transformation, and lastly, we have conjugation. In transduction, the genetic material is transferred from one organism to the other using viruses. Meanwhile, in transformation, genetic information is taken from the environment and directly inserted by the organism into its genome. And finally, in conjugation, two organisms, usually closely related, use appendages called sex pili to transfer these genetic sequences from one organism to the other. Next, let's talk about how genetic variations are passed. These differ depending on the mode of reproduction by the organism. In organisms that undergo asexual reproduction, the variation is directly passed on to the organism's progeny. So we can see that there is a direct link and a direct passage of the genetic variation from one organism to the other. In organisms that use sexual reproduction, it's a bit more complicated because only germline or mutations in the gametes are actually passed on to progeny. So here we can see an example of a parent and their offspring, and we can see that only the mutations in the germline cells are passed on to the offspring. Meanwhile, mutations in the other types of cells, which we call somatic cells, while they can be detrimental, they do not really affect the offspring in any way. Now that we have discussed these different sources of genetic variation, let's talk about some applications. The most common one is to compare these different mutations. 
To do this, we have to take a look at genes called homologous genes. These are genes with a similar function, and the reason for that is because they have a common ancestry. So by looking at these genes, we can take a look at the relationships between our different organisms. There are two main types of genes that we can look at. First are highly conserved genes, which are found in almost all species. Usually, these genes are essential for cellular processes like translation and DNA replication. Because of this, they have the lowest rates of mutation, and they can be used to compare even distantly related species. Then we have genes that we call selectively neutral, or genes that contain selectively neutral mutations. And these are mutations that do not affect the cell in any meaningful way, and so they have a constant rate of mutation. Because of this, they can be used for closely related species. By looking at our different mutations, we can come up with phylogenetic trees, and these depict the evolutionary relationships among a group of organisms. We can create these trees by comparing the number of mutations between organisms in selected genes. Now in this example, we can see a phylogenetic tree of the different higher primates. And we can see that there is only a small amount of difference in the gene sequences between these different primates. Now, if you use a much more conserved gene, you can come up with a phylogenetic tree like this. So this uses a highly conserved gene and it's used across different domains. The specific gene used here is called the small subunit ribosomal rRNA gene. And it can be used to compare organisms even among different domains of life, the bacteria, the archaea, and the eukaryotes. Another analysis that we can do is comparative genomics. Here, we are comparing large regions of chromosomes or even whole genomes between different organisms. This is becoming much more common nowadays because whole genome sequencing is becoming more affordable. By doing this, we can reveal conserved regions among different organisms. So in this example, we can see a variety of organisms from primates to mammals and even birds like chicken and fish. And we can see that there are regions here that are highly conserved even among these different organisms, like this exon here. And there are some regions which are only conserved in specific groups, like these mammalian conserved intron sequences. Let's move on to something closer to home. In the human genome, there are approximately 3.2 times 10 to the 9th nucleotide pairs, or 3.2 billion nucleotide pairs. But if we look at this figure, we can actually see that only less than 2% of the human genome actually codes for proteins, and that is this portion right here. This comprises approximately 19,000 genes. Another thing that we can see very evident in this figure is that almost 50% of our gene are composed of different mobile genetic elements. And this points to a time when our genome was highly mutated. Now, if you look at the different genetic differences between humans or the interhuman genetic difference, we can see that there is a less than 0.1% between our different individuals. Among these differences, the most important ones are called single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs for short. In this figure, we can see an example of those SNPs, and it is estimated there is approximately one SNP per 1,000 nucleotide pairs. Now, these SNPs are a nucleotide difference that is found in at least 1% of humans, and they are important because they can be linked to various heritable differences between humans. So these can be diseases or even some predispositions to certain conditions. All right, so that is all for our lecture. If you would like to learn more, please make sure to check out these references. Thank you for listening. If you found this video informative, please consider subscribing to our channel.